Well, let's see if I still remember how to do this. Okay. This is the mop-up for July 18th, 2023, and I am 51% of David Feldman, feeling better each day, feeling stronger each day. Thank you for all your kind words. You know who you are. Thank you for your kind words. Donald Trump Jr. is supposed to be in Australia this week, but his speaking tour got canceled. Aww. Several LGBTQ groups in Australia initially accused the former president's idiot son of spreading hate and misinformation. And these groups tried to block Australia from giving Don Jr. a visa. Well, Don Jr. was forced to cancel his tour of Australia. And of course, he blamed the cancel culture. He insisted that he couldn't speak in Australia because he was being silenced by the left. But that's not true. It turns out Don Jr. was silenced not by the Australian left. He got his work visa. No, turned out Don Jr. was silenced by slow ticket sales. That's why Don Jr. was forced to cancel his tour of Australia. But Don Jr. can't admit to himself that he's a failure. He can't admit to, I guess he has fans, that he's a failure. So instead, he blames the cancel culture. Claire O'Neill is a member of Australia's Labour Party. She serves as Minister of Cyber Security and Home Affairs. And she took exception to Don Trump Jr., Donald Trump Jr., and the organizers of Turning Points Australia. Turning Points Australia are the clowns who booked the Don Jr. tour that nobody wanted to see. Uh, Claire O'Neill accused uh, Don Jr. and Turning Points Australia of lying, of misleading the public when they claimed the tour was canceled because the Australian government declined Don Jr.'s request for a visa. That's a lie. O'Neill says Don Jr. was given his visa and was welcome to speak in Australia, but nobody wanted to hear him, certainly not pay to hear him. Poor ticket sales. But blame everything on the censorious left, right? That's the go-to for people like Don Donald Trump Jr. blamed the censorious left. Meanwhile, Republicans are banning books, going after librarians, attacking members of the press, calling the news media enemies of the state. They're banning the teaching of critical race and sex education, and they're outlawing performances by drag queens. But somehow it's the left that opposes free speech. You see, the truth is the left believes in free speech. It doesn't believe in hate speech. It doesn't believe in the kind of speech that gets people killed. The left doesn't believe in letting politicians and celebrities get away with spreading fake science based on discredited research because hate speech and fake science based on discredited research gets people killed. The left doesn't believe in banning speech. It believes in correcting speech. When you say something racist, homophobic, or false about climate change, the left is going to correct you. They're not going to shut you up. They're going to correct you. The same way a teacher giving you an F on an essay loaded with errors isn't censorship. It's an F. It's correcting your speech because it's wrong. You're getting an F because just because you're talking and thoughts are dribbling from your lips, just because you blow things out your mouth with thunderous authority, that doesn't mean you're correct. It doesn't mean you're smart or decent. The right wing in America is one big propaganda machine funded by oil companies, big business, bigoted Christians and racists. They are all bullies in the classic sense. And bullies cannot be questioned because bullies cannot live in a world where there is an opposing viewpoint. They cannot live in a world where they are wrong. And so they accuse the left of doing what they do. 
silencing opposing viewpoints. Anybody who questions their facts is trying to censor them. The truth is, nobody was censoring Don Jr. The Australians are much smarter than Americans. They're too smart to pay to see Don Jr. speak in Australia because they know he's an idiot and he's also a bully and a liar who has to blame it all on censorship. Has nothing to do with censorship. This is Claire O'Neill's tweet that she ended up taking down. She's uh, from the Labor Party. And here she is calling Don Jr. out on uh, his BS. Geez, Donald Trump Jr. is a bit of a sore loser. His dad lost an election fair and square, but he says it was stolen. Now he's trying to blame the Australian government for his poor ticket sales and canceled tour. He's just a big baby who isn't very popular. Yeah. Well, Turning Points Australia didn't get Don Jr., but Turning Points USA had another one of their big conferences in Florida last weekend where a heavy-lidded, a heavy-lidded Don Jr. went after FBI Director Christopher Wray. He's mad at Christopher Wray for looking into Donald Trump Sr.'s mishandling of classified documents. Don Jr. is appalled that the FBI is wasting human resources investigating his father instead of focusing on the real threats to America. And what does Don Jr. say are the real threats to America? I wish I was making this up. Don Jr. says the real threat to America are transgender terrorists. Again, I wish I were making this up. Don Jr. is trying to convince Republicans that America is under siege by transgender terrorists. Yes, it's not good enough to terrorize the transgender community here in America. Republicans like Don Jr. are now labeling, labeling the transgender community as terrorists. Listen to this dangerous, heavy-lidded idiot. Right? They won't look at, like, trans terror. Because, I mean, if you're trans in 2023, you're like the most protected class in the history of the world. You can literally do anything you want, and nothing will happen to you. We haven't seen the manifestos because, you know, I've heard all sorts of other terrors are terror, except for trans terror. That's different. That's special. You get protected. How do you get to that point? How starved are you for your father's approval that you would get up in front of a group of people and accuse the transgender community of terrorism? This is what he said over the weekend. He's saying, don't prosecute my father for violating, oh, I don't know, the Espionage Act or inciting an insurrection or attempting to steal the 2020 presidential election. No, the FBI needs to focus on the real problems in this world. It is transgender terrorists who he says, you just heard him say, transgender terrorists are the most protected class in America. How do you get there? How does somebody get there? 30 credible rape allegations against his father, two impeachments, countless indictments, and yet not one day in jail. So far, not one day in jail, but somehow members of the transgender community in Don Jr.'s poisoned world, members of the transgender community are the most protected people in America, despite being most likely to be beaten and raped by cops. Uh, they're less likely to find work or housing, some of the highest rates of depression, and of course, suicide among our transgender community. But in Don Jr.'s demented world, the most vulnerable people in America, the transgender community, terrorists. Please continue heavy-lidded Don Jr., Luckily, I don't snort all cocaine. Like, it's not my thing. I, I guess he was talking about uh, Hunter Biden, and he, 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 he volunteered that he doesn't what? Luckily, I don't snort all cocaine. Like, it's not my thing. My favorite part of this? Oh. 
<laughs> ah! You know, anybody who uh, doesn't snort cocaine doesn't make these kind of sounds. Luckily, I don't snort all cocaine. Like, it's not my thing. Yeah, I, I don't think he snorts cocaine. Oh. I, I don't. I, I th maybe he injects it. I mean, that's what people are saying. I, I would never... I don't know, but a lot of people are saying that Don Jr. is addicted to Adderall and cocaine. That's what people are saying. I don't know if it's true or not, but a lot of people, a lot of people judging by how he speaks, you know, he's heavy lidded, he slurs his speech. A lot of people are saying Don Jr. is addicted to Adderall and cocaine. I don't know if it's true, but that's what a lot of people are saying. Luckily, I don't snort all cocaine. Like, it's not my thing. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? Luckily, I don't snort all cocaine. Like, it's not my thing. It's oh. not his thing. It's not his thing. No, being uh, humiliated uh, by Kimberly Gargoyle, uh, BDSM, I think that's it, more his thing. Well, yes, that's definitely the sound a sober person makes. Ah! Right? Well... The Republican Party, believe it or not, belongs to Donald Trump and Don Jr. Nobody comes close. This is Donald Trump's party. Asa Hutchinson is a former governor of Arkansas, and uh, he, uh, he's running for president as the kinder, gentler, more reasonable Republican. He's a very kind man, Asa Hutchinson. He's not as distasteful as Trump. That's how he's presenting himself. As governor of Arkansas, 18,000 residents of Arkansas got thrown off Medicaid because the sweet, gentle, kind Asa Hutchinson insisted that in order to qualify for Medicaid in Arkansas, you had to find a job. Isn't that kind and nice? He announced when he was governor that Arkansas wouldn't accept any Syrian refugees because Syrians are really clamoring to live in Arkansas. You know, they left Syria for a reason. Moving to Arkansas, I'm pretty sure, would be a step backwards. Asa Hutchinson brought back the death penalty, kind and gentle. He waged war on women by signing a near-total abortion ban that he promised would go into effect once the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade. He waged war against the LGBTQ community by signing a law that allowed Arkansas businesses and landlords to discriminate against the LGBTQ community. Yes, it is still legal in some states, like Arkansas, thanks to Asa Hutchinson, it is still legal to deny housing and employment based on someone's sexual orientation. Very kind and gentle man. This is the antidote to Donald Trump, Asa Hutchinson. This is what is being sold to Republicans as decency. Asa Hutchinson, as governor, signed a law that freed doctors to deny medical care to members of the LGBTQ community based on moral grounds. Yes, it's very moral for a doctor to refuse treatment to a member of the LGBTQ community because you're a bigot. But Asa Hutchinson, he insists Donald Trump's return to the White House would be a recipe for disaster. There is no difference between Donald Trump and Asa Hutchinson other than the brazen corruption, right? I don't think Asa Hutchinson is as corrupt as Donald Trump. But this is not Asa Hutchinson's party anymore, even though he's just as hateful and bigoted and racist and homophobic and misogynistic as Donald Trump. This is not Asa Hutchinson's party because Republicans no longer want to sugarcoat the bigotry, which Asa Hutchinson, you know, he's a gentleman. He's old school. He sugarcoats it. He's a bigot, but he sugarcoats it. The Republican Party now is different. It's Donald Trump's. And these people, these Republicans, Donald Trump's Republicans, want to punish our most vulnerable brazenly out in the open don't pull any punches here is asa hutchinson over the weekend at the turning points usa conference in florida 
attempting to gild a patina of grace and decency over a rotted out platform of racism, misogyny, homophobia, and sadism, but the audience wasn't having any part of it. It's my, I am delighted to be here today to express my support for young people being engaged in the political arena and fighting for the conservative cause. I don't know if you could hear the boos, but they, and he deserves it, the, the conservative cause. The conservative cause, since Barry Goldwater, has been hatred and destruction. But now, now, because of Trump, you must relish it. You cannot disguise it. Gone are the days of dog whistles, right? Remember Lee Atwater talking his deathbed confession where he talks about the, the dog whistles? Look up Lee Atwater's death, uh, deathbed confession. Gone are the days of dog whistles. Republicans now, they want it all out in the open. They don't want it sugarcoated. And then it got even worse for this pig, Asa Hutchinson, who deserves to be treated this way. In the middle of his speech, the crowd broke out in a cheer for Donald Trump. There was enormous national pressure to distinguish essential and non-essential businesses. And whenever you... It's Trump's party. It's Trump's party. He is the front runner because Republicans want it all out in the open. They want blood because that's all that the Republicans can offer their voters is blood and, and punishing others. You know, in the past for the Republican Party, income inequality wasn't so pronounced, right? People weren't as desperate as they are now. And so before it got this bad, Republicans like, you know, Ronald Reagan and Richard Nixon and, of course, the Bush family, they could act like they weren't hateful monsters, right? They would cloak it all in patriotism or personal responsibility. And most Republican voters played along because they understood that Nixon and Reagan and Bush couldn't say openly that they hated blacks or Mexicans or women or the LGBTQ community. But the voters, the Republican voters, knew what Nixon, Reagan and Bush meant when they opposed busing, welfare and food stamps. But things have gotten really bad, especially for Republican voters. Half this country can't come up with $1,000 for a medical emergency. It's even worse for Republican voters. They have no money. These Republican voters, they know the government is never going to save them. They know this economy is never going to save them. Save them. They know it's over. They know it's over. Deep in their hearts, they know it's over for this country, and it's over for them. So they don't want to see, uh, they don't want to hear dog whistles anymore. They want to see blood. That's what Republican voters want, and that's what Don Jr. and Don Sr. give the voters. The, the Republican voters now are so desperate and lost, they want it out in the open. They want hatred, bigotry. They want to see people suffering because that's all these Republican voters have left. It's the only joy left in their life. The, the thrill of someone else being worse off than they are. That's how Don Jr. thrives. That's how Don Jr. can can get away with warning everyone about these fictitious transgender terrorists. And that's what Trump offers. That's what the Trump family offers. The del that's what Ron DeSantis offers. The delight in taking it out on others. No policy, no promises to make anybody's life better. 
only promises to make someone else's life worse. There is no longer any artifice in the GOP. This is now the party of hatred, sadism, bigotry, and punishment. That's all. Here is Donald Trump with Maria Bartiromo on Fox News. He was asked about the debates. Now, the debates are only five weeks away. The first Republican debates, I think they're going to be in Wisconsin. And I think they're going to be on Fox News. They're, it's August 23rd. I mean, this election is happening. And Trump has refused to pledge support for whoever is nominated by the Republicans. And that automatically disqualifies him from participating in the debates. But if he really wanted to participate in these debates, he could do what Chris Christie is doing and lie, right? Chris Christie has publicly declared he would never support Trump if he's the Republican nominee. But to get on that debate stage, Chris Christie lies and said that he would support whoever is the candidate. Christie is lying. And here is Trump Sunday on whether he will take part in next month's Republican debate. Will you be on that stage? Are you participating in the upcoming debate? Well, you know, it's a uh, quite an easy question normally. When you have a big lead, you don't do it. And we have a lead of 50 and 60 points in some cases, and uh, some of these people are at zero. Uh, Ron DeSanctis, as I call him, or DeSanctimonious, is down to, uh, he's in the teens now, and I'm at 50 and 60 and 65, and even I saw one today at 70. And so you're leading people by 50 and 60 points, and you say, why would you be doing a debate? It's not, it's actually not fair. Why would you let somebody that's at zero or at one or two or three, you know, be popping you with questions? Right. Now, Trump is a liar, but he's telling the truth. He owns the Republican Party. He owns the nomination. Nobody comes close. Here are the real clear politics averages nationally, which... Uh, don't really mean anything. The, the real polls are Iowa and uh, New Hampshire. But take a look at the real clear politics averages nationally. Donald Trump has 53.8% of the vote. DeSantis is in second place with 19.7% of the vote. So what is that? That's Donald Trump has more than twice the number of votes as DeSantis, then Mike Pence nationally has 6%, and Ramaswamy has 4.5. Vivek Ramaswamy, I'll talk about him in a second. He has 4.5% uh, nationally. Uh, then you get to Iowa, and this is more important. This is very interesting. Trump has 47.7% of the vote in Iowa. Uh, DeSantis has 23.7, so Trump has more than double what DeSantis has. Nikki Haley has 4%, and Senator Tim Scott, 3.7%. Uh, and uh, Iowa's important. It's the first contest. It's January 15th, 2024, not that far away. I mean, you know, in two months, this stuff starts getting serious, and Trump is more than doubling DeSantis's numbers. Mike Pence in Iowa isn't even registering. In Iowa, I have to believe, and I've been saying this, I've been saying that Pence could win Iowa. I have to believe he, he will do better than these numbers. He's not even registering in the polls. I'm shocked that he's not in the top four uh, because there's a huge evangelical community in Iowa if you remember, Rick Santorum won Iowa in 2012. He surprised everyone. Santorum, like Pence, is anti-abortion. Uh, I don't know. I don't think, I think you underestimate the anti-abortion vote at your own peril. I, I'm, I still believe Pence is more dangerous than the polls show. There are you know, he's a former vice president, and there are a lot of establishment Republicans who won't admit it, but secretly prefer him to Trump. That's what I feel in my gut, but 
I'm wrong. I mean, I know that I'm wrong. The New York Times is reporting that Mike Pence might not even qualify for next month's debate. See, you need 40,000 individual donors to qualify for the debate next month. And the New York Times says Mike Pence is coming up short. He's only raised $1.2 million. That's shocking. I find this shocking that Mike Pence has only raised one point two. DeSantis has raised twenty million dollars. Nikki Haley, four point three million dollars. Senator Tim Scott has raised six million, and of course Trump has raised thirty-five million. I mean, it's shocking to me how hated Mike Pence is. I mean, you know, I hate Mike Pence. I'm just shocked that the millions of people I hate also hate him. I can't believe the people who I hate also hate Mike Pence. I guess Mike Pence, and again, I'm not writing him off. I, I still think he can win Iowa. I'm usually wrong, but uh, <laughs> I still believe. Uh, maybe, not maybe, Pence's problem with Republican voters is he's too cute by half. Even the religious right, as stupid as they are, can see through him. During an interview with Tucker Carlson at last Friday's meeting of the Family Policy Alliance in Des Moines, Iowa, Pence refused to call January 6th an insurrection. He said it was just a riot, a spontaneous riot, he said, that got out of control. A spontaneous riot, just spontaneous, where armed participants came with ropes and gallows to hang the vice president. Yes, a spontaneous riot where the vice president of the United States refused to get in a limousine with the Secret Service that day for fear they would drag him into the clutches of Donald Trump, who watched the, quote, riot while telling aides that Mike Pence deserved to be hanged, unquote. Yes, it was just a spontaneous riot. Some protesters, they just got out of hand. It was spontaneous, where Trump and his legal team hounded Mike Pence spontaneously for weeks in advance of this spontaneous riot. They hounded him, trying to convince him to defy the, Consti the Constitution and declare Donald Trump the winner on January 6th. Yes, it was all just a spontaneous riot that materialized out of thin air on January 6th, where Donald Trump, on January 6th, told a heavily armed crowd to go to the Capitol and fight like hell. It was just a, a spontaneous riot. It was a protest that turned into a riot. Mike Pence really is the worst. He is the worst. I'm just amazed that everyone knows it. I'm, I'm just amazed that everybody hates him. He is the worst. This is uh, Vivek Ramaswamy. Am I allowed to call him Ramaswamy? Because he is the definition of swarmy, Vivek Ramaswamy. I don't know uh, if I'm allowed to, to call him smarmy. Uh, I'm on pain medication for these kidney stones, so I don't, I don't know what I'm saying. Maybe I'm not allowed to call Vivek Ramaswamy Vivek Ramaswamy, swarmy. But he is swarmy. He is running for the Republican nomination. He's never held elective office, went to Harvard College, Yale Law School, started a hedge fund that's anti-woke, anti-corporate responsibility. He wants to abolish the IRS, the FBI, and the Department of Education. He says if he were elected president, he would fire at least half the federal government workforce and put an end to collective bargaining for federal employees. He believes abortion is murder, wants to raise the voting age to 26, wants to end support for Ukraine, and says in exchange for peace, Russia should be allowed to keep the Donbass region and Crimea. And uh, he's doing slightly worse, just slightly worse than Mike Pence in the national polls. Uh, can you see this? Ramaswamy has 4.5% of the vote. Pence has 6%. Again, this is uh, these are the national real clear averages. Well, 
Here is Vivek Ramaswamy, if I'm allowed to call him Swarmy, I don't know. Here is Vivek Ramaswamy with Tucker Carlson Friday night in Des Moines, Iowa at the Family Leadership Summit. You want to know what caused January 6th? Ah, okay. You know, Mike Pence said it was just a riot. Vivek Ramaswamy is going to tell us what caused January 6th. I think I know what caused it. It was a massive conspiracy percolating from Trump's Oval Office, a conspiracy that convinced millions of boneheaded Americans that Joe Biden stole the 2020 election. That's what caused January 6th. January 6th was caused by a president conspiring with lawyers, lawyers with dubious understanding of the Constitution. Donald Trump conspired with attorneys like Rudy Giuliani, Sidney Powell, John Eastman, who worked as a clerk for Clarence Thomas, Ginny Thomas, the wife of Clarence Thomas, Jeffrey Clark, a low-level Justice Department official who Donald Trump wanted to name attorney general in the final days of his administration so Jeffrey Clark could stop the certification of the 2020 presidential election. January 6th was caused by former General Michael Flynn, who, after being pardoned by Donald Trump, worked on a plan for Trump to order the military to seize the voting machines. January 6th was caused by people like Roger Stone and Steve Bannon, who apparently coordinated with the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers to show up at the nation's capital on January 6th, fully armed. That's what, that's what caused January 6th, I think, an out-of-control White House that tried to, con- that tried to strong-arm officials in Arizona, Georgia, Las Vegas, New, Mo- New Mexico, and Pennsylvania to switch the results in favor of Trump while spreading lies to millions of low-information psychopaths that Joe Biden stole the 2020 presidential election. That's what caused January 6th. But Vivek Ramaswamy graduated from Yale Law School. You tell me what caused January 6th. Pervasive censorship in this country in the lead-up to January 6th. Oh, pervasive censorship in the lead up to January 6th caused January 6th. I see. Thank you for for explaining that to me. The people who stormed the Capitol, they did that because they were being censored. Like, you know, Don Jr. was censored in Australia with people not buying his tickets. This was all about censorship, January 6th. This was all about their First Amendment right to say what they think. I'd say to write what they think, but I doubt any of those people know how to do that. Yes, this January 6th was about freedom of expression. That's all it was. These people were sick of the pervasive censorship that prevented them from hanging Mike Pence, that kind of censorship. The pervasive censorship that kept these hard-working decent Americans from using their First Amendment right to call for the murder of Nancy Pelosi. Good Americans who just wanted to speak their mind, but they were being censored. They weren't, they weren't being heard. They weren't being listened to with their zip ties, bear spray, guns, and knives. It was all about freedom of expression peace-loving, law-abiding American citizens who simply don't want to be censored. You know, the way Don Jr. was censored when he wasn't allowed to speak in Australia because nobody wanted to pay to see him. Vivek Ramaswamy, how do you get to this place? You go to Harvard, you graduate from Yale Law School. How do you get to a place where you're willing to say, that January 6th was caused by pervasive censorship. How do you get to this place, Don Jr., railing against transgender terrorists and Vivek Ramaswamy rewriting January 6th and portraying the more than 1,000 men and women arrested for destroying the Capitol, trying to kill Mike Pence and Nancy Pelosi, 
some of whom, like the Oath Keepers and the Proud Boys, have already been convicted, convicted, and are doing time for seditious conspiracy. Sedition. Seditious conspiracy. But Vivek Ramaswamy, he rewrites history and says January 6th was all about freedom of speech. Law-abiding Americans simply standing up for their First Amendment rights. How do you get to a place like that, Vivek, where you would say such a thing? Because he wants to win in the Republican Party, and it's all about denying the facts that are in front of us. Climate change denial, election denial, January 6th denial. It doesn't matter what the evidence is. It doesn't matter that the head of the FBI, Christopher Wray, a Republican who was appointed by Donald Trump, right? A member of the Federalist Society. It doesn't matter that Christopher Wray, the head of the FBI, has testified that Antifa doesn't exist. It doesn't matter that study after study shows that Black Lives Matter and Antifa played absolutely no role in the rioting and looting that took place after the murder of George Floyd. It doesn't matter if you're a Republican or you have a show on Fox News. Just call Antifa and Black Lives Matter just as dangerous as the people who, quote unquote, rioted on January 6th. Deny the truth. Keep saying Antifa and Black Lives Matter are terrorist organizations, that they blew up buildings after George Floyd was murdered. Keep lying. Say that there are transgender terrorists. It doesn't matter in the Republican Party what the truth is so long as it satisfies your blood lust. Here are the real clear averages in New Hampshire for the Republican Party. Kind of interesting. Trump has 42.7 percent. Ron DeSantis, 18.7. You know, DeSantis was doing much better. He's cratering 18.7 percent. Chris Christie, and here's where it gets interesting. New Hampshire's important. Chris Christie has 4.7 percent. And then Nikki Haley has 4.3 percent. Now, Trump says he doesn't think he should debate because all these guys, he's right. All these guys and gals are trailing him. And he feels he shouldn't have to debate them. But here's the thing. Chris Christie is going to be on that debate stage in August, and I'm sure the debate stage is thrilled about that. Uh, Chris Christie is going to challenge Trump, whether he's there or not. Nikki Haley, she's running for vice president. She wants Trump to pick her as his vice president. But uh, Chris Christie's going to challenge Trump, whether Trump's there or not. And Ron DeSantis, you know, one of the myths about Ron DeSantis has been that he hasn't taken on Donald Trump. Well, Ron DeSantis is going to be on that debate stage next month, and he's going to take on Donald Trump. Here is a sample of Ron DeSantis going on the offensive this past weekend. Here's a preview of what Trump will be told to his face if he shares the debate stage with Ron DeSantis next month. He promised to drain the swamp. It got worse. He did not drain the swamp. He promised to Bill have Mexico pay for a border wall. They did like 50 miles of wall. There's massive expansive still there. He said he was going to eliminate the national debt. They added almost $8 trillion to the debt uh, in four years. And of course, in 2020, he turned the country over to Dr. Fauci and those lockdowns and the borrowing and printing really sent us on a bad course. So... The question is, the, the, these debates are five weeks away. Will Trump walk away from this fight? I don't think he can. He lives for the fight. Now, look, I, I'm, I'm wrong about Pence. I keep saying Pence is going to win Iowa. So far, I've been wrong about that. Uh, I just don't think Trump can stay away from next month's debate stage. But I'm often wrong. 
I mean, that's all Trump has is the fight. So it'll be really interesting to see if he can stay away. Meanwhile, DeSantis is cratering in the polls and burning through his $20 million war chest. According to Saturday's filing with the Federal Election Commission, DeSantis has about $12 million left, and it's forcing him to fire. So far, about a dozen campaign workers. More firings are expected. DeSantis has 92 full-time staffers. That's the largest number of employees among the Republican candidates. This is kind of interesting. Uh, USA Today reports that DeSantis, his war chest comes from large donors. Most of DeSantis's money is from rich people pledging the maximum amount by law, which is different from Donald Trump, whose war chest has been filled by small donors. And USA Today points out that candidates who rely on lots of donors giving small amounts of cash are more likely to thrive in both the primaries and the general election. Hard to believe, but Donald Trump, it is a grassroots campaign. People who have no money are donating to somebody who claims to be a billionaire. You can't get any dumber than that. Well, DeSantis is running on bigotry because he can't run on his record. Uh, I've been over this countless times. Uh, DeSantis is a failure on COVID, crime, education, health care. DeSantis's record is abysmal. Again, I've gone over this countless times. Highest crime rate in America is in Mr. Law and Order's Florida. Uh, COVID deaths, disaster with the COVID uh, worst health care, uh, among the worst health care in America. Worst, uh, I think Florida has the largest number of high school dropouts. Uh, he's a failure. All he offers is his imaginary war on the woke. All he offers is persecution of black people and members of the LGBT community. Now, if you listen to the Republicans... They will lie and say inflation is getting worse. Uh, it's not. Inflation was bad last year. It was the worst it had been in 40 years. But inflation seems to be tamed with the annual inflation rate now down to 3% as opposed to last year when it was around 9%. But the Republicans, they keep insisting there's rampant inflation due to all that government spending. It's a lie. Even, you know, government spending has nothing to do with this inflation. That's according to the Federal Reserve. Government spending, no relation to uh, rising costs. You know where inflation isn't being tamed? Florida. The highest inflation rate is in Florida. Cities like Florida... Uh, cities like uh, cities like uh, Tampa and Miami and Florida are double the national average. So DeSantis can't even run on inflation. And one of the leading drivers of inflation in Florida is climate change. You know, the thing that Ron DeSantis says isn't real in Florida. Thanks to climate change, homeowner insurance costs on average six thousand dollars a year as opposed to the national average which is seventeen hundred dollars a year people in florida can't get home insurance because of climate change right the hurricanes are more intense causing more destruction 15 insurance companies in florida have gone belly up in the past 23 years because the hurricanes and the flooding are getting worse but ron desantis he doesn't care because he's there to protect the fossil fuel industry. He has passed two laws in the past two years. One forbids Florida's state pension funds from divesting themselves of fossil fuel investments, a tool of the oil companies, and more. I mean, this is just outrageous. He signed a law last year that forbids cities in Florida 
from switching to renewable energy, right? Florida is like ground zero for climate change. Florida's going to be underwater in about 10 years. It'll finally be a blue state, but it'll be underwater. Uh, and Ron DeSantis doesn't care. He's beholden to the oil companies. And he literally signed a law that forbids cities from switching to renewable energy. He literally signed a law that forces, you know, Mr. State's rights, but not city rights, I guess. He literally signed a bill that insists that Florida cities must keep using fossil fuels. He signed a bill, and this bill, no surprise, sponsored by the oil and gas lobbyists. This is why the Republican Party belongs to Donald Trump. Uh, you know, it, 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 it's, if they weren't killing us, literally killing us, it would be funny. Well, day 511 of the war in Ukraine. Remember, we were told it would be over in a couple of weeks. They always say that whenever there's a war. I don't talk enough about the war in Ukraine because... I know we're not being told the truth, and I don't know what the truth is other than we're being lied to. I know that's the truth. I know everybody's lying to us. I have some theories about what this war is about, at least what Joe Biden thinks it's about. I think Putin and his oligarchs, I know they stole vast sums of money from Russia. They offshored it. From what I've read, Putin and his cronies have parked as much as two-thirds of Russia's GDP in foreign banks. And I'm pretty sure they own way too many Republican politicians, probably a few Democrats. I think they own, the, Repub the Republicans are owned by Putin, and I think Putin owns just enough Republican politicians for uh, the Mueller investigation uh, to actually expose it. I don't think the system here in America could survive that kind of stress to reveal how deeply entrenched the Russian mafia money is in our economy. I know America is run right now by self-serving, money-grubbing businessmen, money launderers and politicians who are only loyal to cash. And I'm pretty sure the oligarchs, Russian, some Ukrainian oligarchs, I'm pretty sure they didn't buy only real estate in America. I think they bought businesses. I think they bought more than anybody is willing to tell us because America is the number one tax haven in the world. That's a fact. Read ProPublica's reporting on this. America is the number one tax haven in the world. It used to be the Cayman Islands, used to be Switzerland. Now it's America. This country is the number one money launderer in the world. If you have dirty money, our banks will clean it for you. And it just doesn't stop with the banks. Real estate will clean will clean your money. Our businesses will clean your money. So we're talking about a system where the heads of our major banks and our politicians are all cleaning filthy money from Russia. And uh, so I know that Putin and other oligarchs own a good chunk of the Republican Party. But for anyone to really keep saying that, it, it's too much for our system to handle. I think Obama knew this. I think that's what, uh, I think that's why they began, they opened the investigation into uh, Donald Trump during the Obama administration. And I think Biden knows this. I think he's from Delaware, which is one of the biggest money laundering operations in the world. I think he knows about Russian money and and how it's permeated our system. 
So I think the war in Ukraine is not so much about NATO expansion or stopping Putin from invading the East. I think Biden is fighting this war because he thinks, and I'm not saying he's right. This is what I think Biden thinks. I think Biden believes this war in Ukraine is necessary to destroy Putin in order to save Western democracy. I'm not saying he's right. I'm saying this is what Joe Biden believes. I think Joe Biden believes that we must destroy Putin because he owns too much of the West. Again, I'm not saying Biden, Obama, who believes this, and Blinken, our Secretary of State, I'm not saying they're correct. I'm saying this is how they justify giving all those weapons to Zelensky. I think they think we must fight Putin in Ukraine to destroy him in order to save Western democracy. Because they know Putin owns way too many people, much too much real estate, way too many businesses and banks in the West. We know Putin owned Trump. We know Putin owned a large swath of Republican politicians. That's why so many Republicans are insisting we stop funding Zelensky. That's how I see this war. Uh, now, there are still Republicans, people like Mike Pence, who are not beholden to Putin, I don't think, and they want to keep supporting Ukraine. But there are way too many on the right, people like Tucker Carlson, who openly root for Putin, who insist that Ukraine is a Nazi state and that Christians in Ukraine are being arrested, which is partly true. Christians are being arrested in Ukraine, mostly members of the Russian Orthodox Church. Uh, they're being arrested because they've been brainwashed by Patriarch Kirill of Moscow. He's the leader of the Russian Orthodox Church. Patriarch Kirill has openly said it is a noble cause to die on the Ukrainian battlefield fighting for Mother Russia. And there are members of the Russian Orthodox Church in Ukraine. So Ukraine is cracking down on some of these Christians. Is it religious persecution? I don't know. Do disloyal Ukrainians automatically get a pass because of their religion? I mean, if you've heard the speeches of Kirill, the head of the Russian Orthodox Church, uh, you might be a little frightened of some of the leaders of the Russian Orthodox Church living in Ukraine. I don't know. I don't know. The war in Ukraine, I do know, is a disaster. I do know that I don't trust anyone. I don't trust anyone who's rooting for Putin. And I don't trust anyone who thinks the answer to all this is giving Zelensky more weapons instead of dragging Vladimir Putin to the peace table. There are other ways to stop Putin from destroying the West other than fighting him in Ukraine. If Joe Biden, and I do believe that he sees Putin as an existential threat to Western democracy because his tentacles, his financial, Putin's financial tentacles reach so deep into our corrupt economic and political systems, I genuinely believe that Joe Biden believes that fighting Putin in Ukraine will destroy Putin and save Western democracy. But there are other ways to destroy Putin. For example, a Justice Department that digs into all these tax havens here in America, like Joe Biden's Delaware. If we had a Justice Department that opened up the books in South Dakota and Nevada and started prosecuting bankers who are laundering Putin's money, that's a, an easier way, a, a more peaceful way to destroy Vladimir Putin and save Western democracy. 
The problem is, and Joe Biden won't tell you this, Robert Mueller, when he conducted the investigation into Trump's money laundering for Vladimir Putin, nobody is willing to tell us that America's entire economy now is undergirded by dirty money. Like I said, we're the number one tax haven in the world. We are the number one money launderer in the world. It's what props up all those real estate prices. It's what props up the stock market. If we would prosecute the bankers and the real estate companies who launder Russian money here in America, we could destroy Putin. But that would cut into Wall Street's core business model. And like I said, the price of real estate would come crashing down if it weren't being propped up by dirty money. I live in New York City. This entire Manhattan real estate is propped up by the money from oligarchs. It's all about money laundering here in New York City. You cut off the flow of dirty money here in Manhattan, everybody would could afford to buy an apartment in New York City. But we're not going to do that. We're not going to do that. We have to destroy Putin militarily in Ukraine because doing it militarily means more money for our weapons manufacturers. Nobody will tell us the truth about Ukraine, including Anthony Blinken and Joe Biden. There are people who are dedicated to keeping the war machine going. You know, if we had a Justice Department that dug in to the money laundering and the tax havens here in America, we could bring Putin to his knees. But that's not what our government is willing to do. There are people who want to keep the military industrial complex humming along. And there are Republicans who want to keep it humming along. Mike Pence and Chris Christie. And Chris Christie, I, I want to play this clip because he came up with an incredibly imaginative justification over the weekend. It, this was brilliant. This is uh, how Chris Christie justifies uh, funding the war in Ukraine. Uh, again, this is all about saying whatever it takes to keep the war machine humming. But this is Chris Christie. Uh, if it weren't so craven, I'd call it brilliant. This is a proxy war with China. <laughs> Did you hear that? Let me play that again. This stuff is a little low today. What is Ukraine? What is the war in Ukraine? This is a proxy war with China. Ukraine? This is how Chris Christie is selling the war in Ukraine to Republicans as a proxy war with China. OK, this is how Chris Christie plans to thread the needle with Republican voters, because, you see, Republicans love Russia. They get their money from Russia and they hate China. Right. Trump hates China. So Chris Christie is selling the war in Ukraine by insisting, no, this isn't a proxy war against Putin. We like Putin. This is a proxy war against China because we hate China. You got to love this. I mean, Chris Christie knows most Republicans wanted to fund Ukraine because most Republicans are financially beholden to Putin. And the Republicans love Putin because Putin is a white Christian nationalist. He's an authoritarian who persecutes the LGBTQ community. He is everything the Republicans love. They see him as the great white hope for Asia. But Chris Christie wants to keep the war going in Ukraine. So he says, no, no, this isn't our friend Russia. We're fighting China in Ukraine. We're fighting China because Trump and the Republicans hate China and love Russia. Go on, Chris Christie. The Chinese are 
funding the Russian war by buying Russian oil. They're coordinating with the Iranians to provide lethal weapons uh, to the Russian army. And we can decide when to have this conflict. Right now, the Ukrainians are willing to fight this fight for themselves if they have our support to be able to win it. Um, if the Chinese watch us back away from Ukraine, as Tucker Carlson and others would uh, advocate, believe me, the next move will be Taiwan. It's incredible how we sell war to the American people. By any means necessary, sell the war. Forget that Putin invaded Ukraine. Forget the Russian separatists who seize Crimea and are fighting to make the Donbass region part of Russia. Forget Russian meddling in our elections and Russia cracking down on dissent, Putin killing his political enemies. Forget all that. We're, this is a war against China, who I don't believe uh, has invaded uh, Ukraine, and I also believe has been trying to drag Biden and Putin to the bargaining table. But sell the war by any means necessary. Sell it as a proxy war against China, because when it comes to keeping a war going, people like Chris Christie will say whatever it takes. Doesn't matter what the truth is. Just keep the American people stupid and terrified and no claim is too outlandish when it comes to, to keeping a war going. When it comes to America spending more than a trillion dollars a year on weapons, you cannot be brash enough in your justifications for keeping a war going. Lie. It doesn't matter. Lie. The American people, when it comes to war, will believe anything like, oh, I don't know, that Iraq attacked us on 9-11 and had weapons of mass destruction. Just say it. If it means going to war, most Americans will believe it and our media will report it. It doesn't matter what the truth is when it comes to war. Here in America, we have to keep the killing machine humming right along. I mean, that is just an amazing talking point that Chris Christie unveiled that this is now a proxy war against China. We have to fight China in Ukraine. That's, uh, doesn't matter what the truth is. Uh, I don't know what the answer is to Ukraine. That's why I don't talk about it that much. All I know is everybody's lying to us. I do know that if the American government really wanted Putin to stop meddling in our elections, we'd make it impossible for our banks and real estate magnates to launder Putin's money. But then that would cut into J.P. Morgan's, J.P. Morgan Chase's profits. It would cut into Jared Kushner's profits. And we can't have that. I don't know what the answer is in Ukraine. I just know that any time, every time there's war and bloodshed, it's because somebody is getting richer and everything we're told is a lie. I'm going to vote for Biden. I have no choice. But when it comes to Ukraine, I know Biden's a liar. I know where he spends his Thanksgiving with David Rubenstein, head of the Carlisle Group, one of the largest war profiteers in the world. I don't know what the answer is to Ukraine. I do know there are other ways to destroy Putin besides relying on weapons, but we will never, ever use anything but weapons because here in America, we are convinced there's no profit in justice, no profit in peace. And that's why we're so effed. That's why we're so effed, because there's so much profit in justice and so much profit in peace. I'm David Feldman, reminding you to stay strong and protect the weak. I'm feeling better. Uh, so uh, thank you for listening. It is a privilege uh, to do this. Uh, I took some time off and I realized how important it is for me to do this, and it is a it is a privilege 
to, uh, what do I say, come into your home? Is that pretentious? Uh, but it is a uh, thank you for listening to me. And uh, this is a grassroots show. Uh, so if you'd like to help, uh, please share this with your friends uh, via uh, social media and e I'm running out of steam. I'm, I'm starting to feel the pain medication, so I'm going to wrap it up. Thank you to the moderators in, in the chat room. Uh, we're going to do office hours when I'm 100 percent. I'm this is I'm still at 51 percent. Uh, please like this. I, it's embarrassing to ask you, but I need you to like my video, share my video. Please subscribe to my channel. Uh, tastes horrible. Bad taste in my mouth when I have to say that. But uh, please share this with your friends. Thank you all for your kind words. Thank you. Uh, it was very healing. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much.